Hello, everyone. This is John Shaw, the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Thanks for joining another edition of our series, Understanding Our New World. And today we're delighted to be joined by Gareth Evans from Australia, who's one of the most respected um, leaders in the international circuit. He's had this uh, remarkable career and continues to make extraordinary contributions. Um, Mr. Evans is from Melbourne, grew up there, went to university at Melbourne, then he went on to Oxford where he studied, came back to Australia, taught law at Melbourne University, uh, became active in Australian politics, spent 21 years in the Australian Parliament working uh, in both the House and Senate, was a cabinet minister with some really important portfolios, he was the country's attorney general, uh, basically the Secretary of Transportation, Secretary of en Energy and then became uh, Australia's foreign minister for eight years. I think is generally considered one of the best, if not the best foreign ministers in Australian history. Um, he then left Australian politics, went to work for the International Crisis Group, which is based in Brussels, does some really important work in conflict prevention. We'll talk about that. Um, during that time, he became part of this really important project, uh, examining basically the notion of sovereignty and was one of the, the lead architects of this uh, new construct called the Responsibility Protect. We will talk about that. He was a chancellor of the Australian National University for almost a decade, has lots of interesting views on education, and he's written or edited 14 books, including some uh, really good ones. I've, uh, his memoir call, is called Incorrigible Optimist. Really well written, very profound and interesting, also very funny. I had some laugh out loud moments. Uh, with that. And then he has a book that just came out in the United States this year, I think it was published last year in Australia, called Good International Citizenship, The Case for Decency. Really important book. Um, so he is uh, really one of the global statesmen, and we feel really delighted to be joined f with by him today, who's uh, gotten up early. It's Tuesday morning in Australia, so he joins us from Melbourne. So good morning, Gareth. Good morning, John. Great pleasure to talk to you and uh, appreciate the hospitality from the Simon Institute. Great. Well, in your memoir, you say that you say I'm not you say it's a it's not a full autobiography. You quip, you said I would not inflict that on anyone, but it does have some really interesting perspectives on your early years. And two kind of areas that jumped out at me was the importance of teachers and travel. And for teachers, you, mm -hmm. you talk about, um, well, well, first of all, you say more broadly, teachers matter, unbelievably so. It cannot be said too often how much good and bad teachers can change kids' lives. And then you talk about a number of the, the teachers that were, or several teachers that were important to you. But the one that I really was struck by was, um, a biology teacher by the name of Norton Hobson, who you said had, quote, alarmingly idiosyncratic political views, but was just wonderful in teaching students to think and discuss and argue. So tell us a little bit about Mr. Hobson. Well, I came from a working class background with no record whatsoever of a family engagement in higher education, even higher school education, let alone university. So it was incredibly important to have teachers like Hobson that were just uh, took you seriously and were incredibly stimulating and opened up vistas of opportunity in the future that uh, would not otherwise exist. And I think that's the experience of a lot of people, and it was certainly mine. Norton Hobson was was a, was one of nature's original, an absolute crazed right winger. Uh, a pretty full on racist, not for sort of moral reason, but sort of eugenic racist. I mean, just just shocking stuff in retrospect. But he was uh, very secular. He exposed me. He, he beat the Christianity out of me by exposing me to uh, Bertrand Russell, why I'm not a Christian and all the other stuff, which would uh, give horrors, I suppose, to many people in the United States. But but just generally, he he made me think and, and created opportunities for and, and was very happy to be argued against with all these crazy views. But, um, you know, he, he, he spent his life just stimulating young kids like me and taking them places they would never otherwise think to go. So I'm, I'm deeply grateful. And at one point, he actually, did he sit down with your parents and kind of just kind of... Yeah, he did, actually, and as did a couple of my other teachers, because uh, they saw something in me which you know, we hadn't as a family. 
and um, they needed to be persuaded that I shouldn't leave school and go and get a good safe job in the public service because they'd been both been children of the depression, had you know terribly rough times in their own childhood and early adulthoods. And uh, they, they, they came and sat down around the kitchen table and said, look, this, this kid needs to be encouraged, needs to stay at school for his final year, and uh, we think we can get him a scholarship to go to university, and you should, and, and, and they, they were very persuasive. And that, that just made a big difference, obviously, to my life. Right. Well, also travel has been big. And I know um, you won a, um, a fellowship to study at, at Oxford and took a, a long 20 country or so trip to to make your way to the UK. But I think a few years before that, you took your first trip, I think it was 1964 to Japan. Um, and one of the things you write about very powerfully is visiting the um, the Peace Park at Hiroshima. Tell us about that moment. Yeah, it was a student trip, um, you know, just going in the, the hold of a boat rather than a steerage class, uh, very cheap. And I spent, you know, several weeks wandering around Japan and just exploring the place. But the most memorable experience was unquestionably Hiroshima, just 20 years after the end of the war. And going to that peace park, and in particular one exhibit I so vividly remember to this day in that museum, a, a, a block of, of stone, granite, uh, taken from the steps of a bank building in the middle of Hiroshima, in which was embedded the shadow of a person who had been sitting on those steps in that bright sunny morning when the, the bomb went off. And, uh, you know, the force of the, the blast, the explosion, the, the heat sort of crystallized the, the, the stone around him, leaving this sort of shadow. And for, for whatever reason, I mean, that, that just struck me then, the incredible indiscriminate inhumanity of this new weapon. And uh, I, I tucked that away as a, as, a, as a formative experience, along with other, many other formative experiences, I guess, I had during later student travels. Uh, and it, it really became a central motif, I guess, a central governing uh, motive in a lot of the things I did subsequently in my public life, just that, that urge to do something to ensure that nobody else experienced that, that fate again. Yeah. Right. Well, let's talk about um, entering Australian politics and serving in the parliament. And you write about it uh, very vividly. It, it was a rough and tumble environment, probably still is. You call it 21 years of insensitivity training, which um, I think, uh, and then you also call politics a dangerous trade. So talk a about and a bloody and dangerous trade, I think is the expression. <laughs> well, tell yeah. us about being an Australian parliamentarian and what was that that was like? Well, I think everybody goes into politics for a mixture of motives. There's a sort of spectrum which I identify and which you can really place just about anyone. At one end is idealism, going in there to try to do something decent uh, for country, make the world a better place. At the other end of the spectrum is what I call megalomania, the, the desire to exercise some kind of authority to be there uh, to enjoy the, the fruits of office. I think I was probably pretty much at the idealistic end of the spectrum. Um, uh, others, of course, uh, rather in other places. And as a result, um, life gets pretty interesting when you're dealing with uh, with people, um, you know, with, with so many different views of what politics is all about. But, um, you know, one, one, one thing I... I basically went into politics to get stuff done, not just for the, the thrill of the chase and the, the excitement of the, uh, the Sturm and Drung and the, the often third rate vaudeville of, of Westminster system parliamentary theatre. I, I went in there because I, I wanted to, to do stuff. And the years in opposition were horror years. The years in government were uh, often challenging and a bit of a, a sleigh ride, a bit of a roller coaster road but uh, but they were they were years of an extraordinary sense of the art of the possible and, and getting stuff done so I, I really on balance i enjoyed that uh, that 21 years they were they were but the period in government the 13 years as a cabinet minister were, were clearly the highlight well you described yourself you said my temperament is not of the cloth from which zen masters are cut <laughs> talk about yeah, well, that well, I had a reputation of being a bit cantankerous, and I think in retrospect, I probably would have done a lot better uh, politically through my entire career if I'd slept another hour a night, um, you know, rather than being constantly up and, and working away at stuff. But um, no, I mean, uh, people's people's you're either sort of a schmoozing temperament or you're a sort of a, a cut through temperament. And um, 
I tend to, uh, you know, want to get stuff done and be very impatient with people who don't share that, those ambitions and those aspirations and those commitments. And, uh, you know, just a little bit too intolerant, I think, in retrospect. But um, so that, that, that self-description is one that's, uh, you know, <laughs> it's appealed to a lot of people. It's pretty accurate. I mean, it's a, it's a hard concession to make. But, uh, but uh, you know, I think, I've, I think I've slowed down a bit. Haven't quite acquired the Buddhist temperament, but uh, I'm working on it. <laughs> well, let's talk about um, so the the uh, the Labor Party wins government in 1983. I happened to be in Australia at the time, and I remember just the feeling of excitement because it you, the, the Labor Party had been largely in the political wilderness since World War II, maybe even before. There was a brief period in the 70s in which they had a kind of an interesting, a very interesting government that that was short lived. So you come into power in 1983 and you were the attorney general and you had, you know, some really powerful sweeping things you wanted to do. Um, and you, you accomplished a great deal, but there was also the sense that the government had been elected largely for economic reasons, economic restructuring. And you write, and so it struck me as you write about it, you say, in some sense, it was like the, the right job at the wrong time. Uh, you say, I misread the mood of the time and my colleagues in government. Talk about that, if you would. Well, I went in there with a huge reforming agenda, the the unfinished business of the uh, the Whitlam government that you refer to, including law reform, constitutional reform, and a whole bunch of stuff, establishing a national bill of rights, which was missing from the Australian system, uh, establishing freedom of information legislation that really bit. And I snuck some of that past my colleagues in the opening months before they really realised what was going on, and they never quite forgave me freedom of information, for Christ's sake, that's something you do in opposition. That's not something you uh, you uh, you live with in government. What, what are you trying to do? It's embarrass us. And, uh, you know, quite a few other things happened, which uh, which generated waves, which the government was not all that interested in, uh, in seeing happen. They wanted to focus on getting the economy right and creating a, a reputation for a capacity for longevity and uh, long-term process. So, you know, it was, it was a learning experience. I was in my early 40s when I came into government. I was... Um, you know, with all the, the all the exuberance that you have at that stage of your life before, you know, the real world practicalities crowd in on you. And um, I was shifted from there to uh, to an economic portfolio, resources and energy, and uh, uh, and you know, there I sort of re reestablished myself as, uh, as someone who was halfway credible rather than some sort of crazed adventurer who was going to bring the government undone through my exuberant excesses. So there we go. Yeah. Well, then you had, uh, you know, probably the one of the most important kind of shifts in your life. You you were chosen as Australia's foreign minister. Uh, you served for I think about eight years. And in your book, you say, "Bliss was it that dawn to be alive, but to be foreign minister was very heaven." If there was ever a period in which it was possible to be optimistic about the state of the world, it was in the late 1980s and the years that followed as the ice flows of the Cold War were breaking up. Talk about the, at that time. Yeah, well, I did, I did channel that line from, uh, from William Wordsworth because it just did seem so apt. The, the world was a different place with the, the breakup of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War, the capacity to find consensus where none had previously existed on the UN Security Council, the sense of possibility in terms of conflict prevention, resolution, uh, rights recognition, uh, movement on big uh, global public goods issues, the capacity for cooperation, collaboration, where none had previously existed in regional settings like my own um, East Asia, Southeast Asia. It was just a, an incredibly exciting period. And um, the fact that we did get a lot of done, I think, was, uh, you know, owed a lot to the, the atmosphere of the time. And uh, whenever I get you know, disgruntled or unhappy about the uh, the state of the world at the moment and the inability of you know governments to to get stuff done in the way that we managed to on quite a large scale in the 90s i have to you know remind myself pinch myself that um, that was a period you know, really unlike any others in in your and my lifetime when that that, that art of the possible uh, just was uh, was very real well, I was really struck in your book by the way that you went about the job as foreign minister, because um, you really had a kind of a, a rigorous approach. I mean, you spent a lot of time thinking about, OK, what are we trying to accomplish? What are our capacities? What are our priorities? 
um, you know, wrote some very careful papers, gave some very thoughtful speeches. So really spend some time trying to think through what you are trying to accomplish as opposed to just reacting to events. I think part of that was my experience as attorney general. I thought I'd better sit down and get this one right uh, rather than just plunging in. Uh, but also because intellectually, I think foreign policy demands that kind of approach. Um, a lot of it is about pure reaction, dealing with the, the stuff coming over the hill at you each morning, uh, which you often can't begin to anticipate. But there is a proactive side to it as well, which requires planning, organization, commitment, priority setting, and a very clear understanding of what you're trying to do, what your national interests are that have to be your priority, but what the art of the possible is in terms of pursuing those interests. And I did make my initial speeches as foreign minister around those sort of conceptual themes, articulating, for example, this, this concept of good international citizenship as a, as a national interest in its own right, which we'll come to in a moment. And I remember a very distinguished political scientist at the Australian National University coming up to me after the, the first of those big you know, speeches saying, well, that was all very well, but when are you going to say something interesting? So uh, that was a little bit of a, a, little bit of a showstopper, but um, I, I, I pursued that approach. And I think it stood me in good stead because as every new issue came up over the horizon, um, I had some sort of intellectual frame of reference, policy frame of reference uh, to respond to it and um, able to convey a sense to the departmental officers, a very fine professional group of, you know, what, what we were about rather than just dealing with the, um, you know, the next problem thrown up by the daily cables. And uh, I think as a result over that nearly eight years in, in government, we were able to achieve a hell of a lot. But, it was very much to do with the, uh, the zeitgeist, the, the spirit of the time, the atmosphere of the time, which, which made a lot of stuff possible. No doubt about that. Well, and you also had a very clear sense of Australia as a middle power. And that yeah. you know, can be t taken perhaps derisively, but it's, as you write <laughs> and explain, it's just a, a factual description of a country that can play an yep. important constructive role on the global scene, but doesn't have the power to just you know, influence and drive events in kind of the macro sense, but can still be an extraordinarily constructive uh, member of the international community. So talk about this concept of, of Australia as yeah, yeah. the middle power. Well, well, my successor as Australian foreign minister from the other side of politics utterly rejected the concepts that we're not a middle power, we're a significant power, and we're not going to diminish ourselves by acknowledging anything, anything less than that. But of course, being a middle power has got nothing to do with your your size or, but it has a lot to do with your capacity and your will to get stuff done. I mean, middle powers are essentially those, as you say, that don't don't have either the economic or military clout to be able to determine the course of events in their own right. You're a, you're a prisoner of larger dynamics, but middle powers are countries with sufficient capability, but also the, the will or the capacity um, to move events through developing cooperative and collaborative strategies by coalition building with other like-minded countries to identify solutions and to actually you know carry them forward and in that sense um, you know the concept of middle power diplomacy harnessing that collective will that capacity that's out there from the countries that are not the superpowers and not the super major powers but nonetheless are capable collectively of making a difference i mean we, we've seen that sort of middle power diplomacy at work in a number of contexts um, you know, in recent years with the cluster bombs and the Oslo Treaty, the Canadian um, Landmines Treaty exercise. Countries like that, the Scandinavians, Canadians, are, are quintessential middle powers in that sense, who, who through the, just the force of their creativity and energy and stamina and capacity to articulate goals and to harness diplomatic support from other like-minded countries can actually get stuff done that are often beyond the capacity of the, the really big guys. Well, you also talk about just, um, you know, representing Australia in the world. And, and you write, uh, I think it was in the context of maybe Australian peacemakers, but if you made a kind of a, a, a broader point, which I, you know, reflects what I observed in the times I've been to Australia, but you write, there seems to be something instinctively egalitarian about Australians, whatever their background, education, or life experience. There is an absolute willingness to take others as they find them, uh, neither sucking up nor kicking down, responding to the way others behave, not the way they look or dress or talk and whatever their station in life. Talk about that aspect of Australia. 
Well, I hope I wasn't over gilding the lily, but it is something that I've seen at work and others have seen at work, particularly, for example, in Australian peacekeeping contingents, in community situations, in often very exotic and very foreign climates in Africa and elsewhere. Um, that that instinctive egalitarian tradition, I think, is very important, and it does convey to other people, other constituencies, a sense that, um, you know, we, we really are in the, in the decency business. I mean, we don't always live up to that. We've often behaved badly um, in Afghanistan and elsewhere. I mean, there's plenty of individual instances of uh, a behavior that uh, is really deeply troubling. But, but overall, I think it is something that, um, that does fit with the national self-image and also to some extent the national reality. I mean, I, I had some experience of this right, right back in my childhood as a kid, because my, my father was a working class guy, he was a tram driver, um, who was full of most appalling prejudices in the abstract. I mean, I won't, I won't sort of spell them out, but you can imagine. But as the successive waves of immigrants came to Australia, first of all, Italians, then Greeks, and then later on you know, from more exotic places, one by one by one, I mean, my father would teach these these guys to drive trams and he'd say, well, you know what I think about Italians, da, 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 da. but I had a little bloke called Luigi today um, teaching me how to drive. Trams. Yeah, lovely little bloke, lovely little bloke. And then there was Spiro the Greek, you know, you know what I think of Greeks, but Spiro, yeah, lovely bloke. And I think there is this, this sense that, um, and it's very, very, very common. I, I live in an area now in, in Melbourne, which is uh, now got many, many uh, African immigrants here, and we don't see too many black faces in this country, and we haven't until recent years. But the, the way in which they sort of embraced and blend into the community really is, is quite, uh, quite startling, and I think quite you know, quite encouraging. And it's, it's a matter of some national pride, I think, that we uh, we do seem to have that national capacity to respond that way. But, you know, we don't always live up to it as a government. And it's very important that we think very carefully about how to translate that that instinct into into practical policy delivery. Right. Well, your, your time is... Uh as foreign minister ended when your, your government lost power. Um, you were in opposition for a short period of time, did not like that very much, but then accepted a remarkable job in Brussels with the International Crisis Group that focuses on conflict uh, re prevention and resolution. A and you wrote of it, you say, the idea was basically to get policy leaders to think about things they didn't want to think about and do the things they didn't want to do. Talk about the International uh, Crisis Group. Well, we had a distinctive methodology, which was based on field-based research, having people out on the ground, not just sitting behind computer screens in the Beltway. We had a focus on sharply defined practical policy solutions to real world uh, conflict problems. And we had uh, a willingness capacity to engage in very direct advocacy at quite a high level because I was a former foreign minister I was able to open doors which a lot of NGOs that were working in that same space were unable to and um, we right from the outset took the view that if we were going to be influential with governments we had to be super professional we had to give governments information that they couldn't easily get through their own sources give them perspectives they might not have thought about and be able to put it in terms of um, policy solutions that were, were capable of being embraced in, in the real world so we did an awful lot of stuff we, we built the organization from a you know, two million dollar organization with you know less than 20 people to a hundred and uh, you know 170 people 70, 80, 70, 70 countries, I think 120 people and a $17 million budget uh, during the time I was there. And I think it was a period again where uh, complete cynicism had not set in, um, complete deadlock had not yet uh, set in again in the, uh, the Security Council. So there was a sense of optimism, not only about particular difficult country situations, but also, um, you know, solving some big and intractable problems. We, we did some really major work on the Israel-Palestine Middle East issue, identifying a sort of an end game first reverse engineering approach to uh, actually implementing a two-stage solution, which I think still reads pretty well, but uh, it's pretty hopeless in terms of getting it embraced. And I think, uh, you know, several years before the Iranian uh, JCPOA, the, uh, that was negotiated, we, we developed a, you know, a game plan and spent a lot of time in Iran and elsewhere um, discussing with the key players um, what the elements of that might be, which um, you know, did foreshadow what, uh, what finally came to, came to pass under the uh, 
previous American administrations. So, um, you know, I think I think we were we were a pretty influential group, and uh, that was a very important part of my life, and it certainly uh, helped me overcome what I've. Uh, described elsewhere as relevance deprivation syndrome, you know, which would otherwise, I think, have afflicted me having left Australian politics after 21 years. And because I wasn't quite ripe for retirement. And that was a wonderful opportunity to to put into effective practice all the, the skill sets that I developed as a minister and certainly all those international contacts. Right. Well, while you were at the crisis group, you were asked to sit on a uh, commission that was yep. effectively organized by the Canadian government. Um, looking at the whole notion of sovereignty and intervention, the brief context being that, you know, for, for decades, uh, you know, there was a notion that what happened within a country was that country's business and it could sort of do what it wanted and no one really had a right to say anything. And you took a, a really fresh and in some sense, almost a revolutionary look at that and said, you know, and the, the battle had been, you know, should we intervene? And you said you reframed it to the responsibility to protect. Talk about that. Well, even with the catastrophes that unfolded in the 1990s that we can all remember, the killing in Rwanda, the killing in Srebrenica, uh, the whole unfolding saga of atrocity crimes in the Balkans, Africa and elsewhere, there was no consensus whatsoever about how to react to that. The global north talked the talk about humanitarian intervention, sending in the Marines but very rarely did so. The Global South hated the whole concept of any kind of imperial exercise of military authority in those situations, even though they're obviously concerned about some of these unfolding atrocity situations. So what we did in that, that commission, with initiated, as you say, by the Canadian government, was tackle the, the, the problem head on, A, by trying to change the language of the debate, moving from the right to intervene to the responsibility to protect, much less neuralgic way of framing the debate, uh, but also changing the emphasis away from just military intervention after the effect after the event to a, a focus on preventive strategies and also a whole variety of reactive strategies that were non-military in character sanctions and naming and shaming diplomatic isolation and uh, the application of international uh, criminal law and so on and we developed this this concept accordingly of the responsibility to protect which which for a, a commission report had a had a remarkable uh, remarkably short um, shelf life i mean well shelf life in the sense of not being consigned to the dust, but actually being picked up and applied. So within within four years of our report coming out, the UN General Assembly, sitting as the World Summit in 2005, had unanimously embraced this concept, which um, did you know, quite dramatically uh, limit uh, hitherto notions of, of sovereignty by getting the world's leaders to unanimously accept that every state had the responsibility to protect its own people from mass atrocity crimes, that other states had a responsibility to assist them to do so if they're in a mood to be so assisted. But critically also, that where a state was manifestly failing to exercise that responsibility to protect its own people, then the wider collective community, international community, had a responsibility to, to act, including in an extreme case with the support of the Security Council uh, through military action. And this was a pretty astonishing, you know, set of concessions to make, um, you know, given the the neuralgia that so many countries um, felt about anything which would would uh, sully that notion of absolutely undisputed, inexorable uh, capacity to to uh, resist intervention and do your own thing, however however ugly it was. So, uh, it, it was a big achievement in two thousand and five. And as you, you, you say, I mean, the implementation has not been perfect. Of course, it, it wouldn't be, but it has fundamentally changed the debate. I mean, it is when we see, you know, horrible things happening in another country, the reflex reaction is not like, well, there's nothing we can do. At least it sparks an intense debate, oftentimes in the Security Council and the General Assembly of the UN saying, OK, what can we do? What should we do? I, th I think that's right. Obviously, there's been a whole series of events that have demonstrated the the limitations of the concept in recent times. I mean, in particular, the uh, the way in which Libya went wrong, Syria exploded into a horrible civil war with endemic atrocity crimes, Yemen, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, and now I suppose, uh, you know, Ukraine, the Russian atrocities being perpetrated there. So it hasn't been an all-purpose panacea, but I think 
what we can say is, is several things. As, as a normative concept, it's taken hold, and that's been demonstrated by successive annual debates in the UN General Assembly, where the concept, even though there's still a few countries like Venezuela and Cuba and Nicaragua who say, no, no, we don't like the whole idea. Nonetheless, the, those basic concepts I described are, are accepted. Secondly, it's, it's worked pretty well in terms of strengthening the institutional capacity to deal with these situations through both civilian and, where necessary, military means. And there's a lot of attention being paid to, um, you know, cooperative behavior by countries in establishing focal points, meeting together to discuss strategies of how we should recognize and respond to these emerging situations and react to them when they do explode. Preventively, um, even though, of course, when you succeed in prevention, nothing happens and nobody notices, which is the endemic problem with any kind of prevention. Um, we, you know, it's, it's not a bad record. Over and over again, um, responsibility protect concepts have been invoked. Um, a lot of African situations and diplomacy has been mounted uh, by the UN or by regional organizations and successfully calmed situations down in a way that might not otherwise have been the case. The, the problem has been in reacting to some of the really ugly, hardest of cases where prevention has manifestly failed. And that's become you know, very much harder um, as the recent years have gone by and it's harder still now with the complete collapse of consensus on the Security Council. But nonetheless, I, I do think the, the atmosphere has changed. And um, I find it all, one way of putting this is Henry Kissinger back in 1975 famously reported as having said, to his Thai counterpart six months after the Khmer Rouge had entered Cambodia, Phnom Penh, and the scale of the atrocities they were beginning to perpetrate was becoming very apparent. Kissinger famously said to his Thai counterpart, you can tell the Cambodians, we'll, we'll, we'll be their friends. They're a murderous bunch of thugs, but we won't let that stand in the way. I just find it impossible to think that anyone these days, you know, could feel it possible to say something like that. I think, um, you know, the the instinct instinct to to do something uh, when this kind of this situation explodes is 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 pretty evident. It's often very very difficult to get agreement. Certainly, very very difficult ever to get agreement on the use of military force. But getting agreement on on sanctions and other kinds of measures of the kind that have now been introduced on a huge scale in response to Russian behaviour in Ukraine, this this is something which I think is now um, getting very much embedded in the in the global DNA. And I I live in hope that um, over the course of the next few years, this this concept will become so comprehensively embedded that um, you know we we will finally see the end of at least for the most part of these these atrocities getting getting the united states to to focus on this is always going to be an issue i mean the us doesn't particularly like the concept of the responsibility to protect it likes the divine right of ad hocery to prevail where it doesn't have a responsibility to do anything very much that it doesn't feel like doing on on the day and even you know people like samantha power my dear friend you know when she was um UN, uh, US representative and uh, to the UN in New York, you know, found it very difficult to, uh, you know, to, to mobilize support for that concept itself. So, you know, there, there are issues, there are difficulties, but uh, I think, you know, that's one of the things we can reasonably say. We, we made a little bit of a difference in changing the way in which the world thinks and acts about these issues. Well, let's talk about good international citizenship, which you described in your memoir, and then you develop more fully in, in this new book and also in some lectures and, and papers you've delivered. And uh, you, let me just read a sentence. You say, for a state to be a good international citizen means above all else, caring about other people's suffering and doing everything reasonably possible to prevent and alleviate it. And then you go on to say that it's not just being a Boy Scout. You use that term a lot. You say, my point is that the returns from good, selfless international behavior are more than just warm inner glows, that such behavior can generate a hard-headed, practical national advantage of the kind that appeals to realists and political cynics, cynics as well as idealists. Sketch out your concept of good international citizenship. Well, everybody gets it that the core business of foreign policy, any country's foreign policy, has to be the 
protection and advancement of national interests, and in particular, the familiar duo of security interests on the one hand, economic prosperity interests on the other. And there is a bit of a disposition to regard all this other stuff as optional extras, not really the core business of foreign policy, but something you do if you're subjected to a little bit of domestic pressure or the mood strikes, we have got resources available, but not something that really ought to be the, the centerpiece of what you're doing. I have a different view. I have a different view that that your performance on these, and the benchmarks for me are your performance on aid, development assistance, your performance on advancing universal human rights as best you possibly can in other countries, your performance in responding as best you can to um, advancing the cause of peace and security, peacemaking, peacekeeping, response to atrocity crimes, and the aftermath of that in terms of the human suffering of refugees and displaced people, um, how you respond to all of that, and also how you respond to the big existential issues where there may not be like, like pandemics, climate, nuclear weapons, where there may not be immediately obvious uh, returns or gains and may indeed involve some national sacrifices to advance those objectives, but where you know, ultimately everybody is better off. I think against those benchmarks, um, which I describe collectively as, as what it is to be a good international citizen, how you perform against them, I think um, that is just a matter, and, and being a good international citizen um, is not just a matter of, of moral imperative, um, doing the right thing because it is the right thing, whatever your, your spiritual or philosophical foundation for your moral beliefs may be founded in our sense of common humanity and so on. It's not just that. My argument is and always has been, going back to the time I was foreign minister, as you say, that this is a national interest in its own right, de demanding and deserving to be up there in lights alongside the traditional duo. So it's not just our national interest in security, not just our national interest in economic prosperity, but our national interest in being and being seen to be a good international citizen. And the foundations of that national interest, putting it in that realist perspective, uh, are the reputational returns, the reciprocity returns uh, in particular that you get from so acting. And I found this quite a useful story to tell my cynical, hard-headed uh, finance minister and other public service colleagues who are pretty skeptical about the, the utility of, um, of being a, a global Boy Scout. Um, what I was able to say, I think, is, and, and to argue fairly effectively, is there are big reputational returns in being seen to be the kind of country uh, that's a decent country that you want to trust, you, warm, you trust you warm to, you want to emulate, you want to visit, you want to invest in, you want to study in, you want to work with on international problem solving, you want to support for international positions. All of those things tend to, to flow reputationally. I mean, as another way of looking at it, of course, is to describe it as soft power, you know, Joe Nye, but soft power to me is more than just Harvard and Hollywood. Soft power is the way in which you perform, way in which you perform on these sort of, you know, really big foreign policy issues. So I think casting it in that way uh, is an important sort of selling point. It's, it's squaring the circle, if you like, between idealism and realism. It's giving you another string to your bow in arguing the case, to put it in national interest terms, uh, than just you know, the warm inner glow argument, which um, you know, politics is a cynical business. Government is a, a cynical and hard-headed business. And it's very hard, you know, to get resources allocated to aid and so on when uh, there are other, you know, instincts screaming for for support, uh, to give support domestically. But um, I think it's pretty important. And uh, it's, a, it's a story that's repeatable in every country. My, my little book, Tiny Little Essay, that you, that you held up, uh, uses Australian examples. Um, but the, the, the themes are, are universal. But the final point to make about all this is about the, you know, the, the politics of decency. There is this sort of instinct that um, you know, for most ordinary electors, charity begins at home, that this stuff is really pretty marginal to their interests and outlooks. But the opinion poll evidence that's been accumulated over many years in Australia tells a quite different story. And every one of the benchmark issues I, I refer to, and I think there is equivalent evidence in many other countries polling, um, citizens are, are sort of you know, remarkably generous, remarkably decent in their instincts and remarkably supportive of governments when they choose to, 
to spend you know energy resources on on advancing them so i you know there may be no particular evidence that you can win elections through focusing on these good international citizenship themes but in my belief in my research you sure as hell don't lose them so it's it's an important story to tell i think and you make the point that good international citizenship is going to be essential to attack the two transcendent yep. issues of climate and nuclear weapons which you say can you know effectively end life on earth um climate you know every day we have new evidence of that and you write about it very powerfully but i, I think you're you're really powerful uh, on on the nuclear front and i want to read a couple sentences in which you say there is every prospect that within the readily foreseeable future those weapons will actually be used the fact <coughs> pardon me the fact that we have not not yet had a nuclear weapon used in conflict for over 75 years is not the result of statesmanship citizen integrity and infallibility or the inherent stability of nuclear deterrence it has been sheer dumb luck and then you recount the number of you know accidents and you know near near uh, mistakes that could have had amazing um, negative consequences talk about um just how we become almost inured to the nuclear threat. Well, these are the most indiscriminately inhumane weapons ever invented and their use on any kind of significant scale, any significant exchange in a military conflict would have catastrophic implications, as you say, for life on Earth, as we know it through the nuclear winter effect, its implications for food production and God knows what else. This is serious, serious stuff. And of course, when, you know, when things don't happen, you know, the, the sense of, of anxiety tends to sort of evaporate. I think a little bit of us creeping back in the context of the Russia-Ukraine affair with the talk, casual talk from the Russian side in particular about possibly using nuclear weapons, making people think again about the possibility. But the, the, but the reality is, I, I, I still one of those who's optimistic enough to think that the deliberate aggressive use of, of nuclear weapons to advance some national objective is extremely unlikely. I, I don't buy into the madman theory that's you know, so often around about what people like the leadership of North Korea might do. I think they're, they're conscious, they're pretty conscious that to be homicidal in that respect would be to be suicidal. But nonetheless, there is a huge, huge risk as as I've said in that 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 note about um, human error, system error, human idiocy, uh, just just miscalculation working itself out, if ever we get into a, a you know a, a difficult situation, and the, the you know the consequences are just are just horrifying. So we've got it. We've got to get serious, not just about nuclear non-proliferation, but but nuclear disarmament. And um, you know here middle power activity, the umbrella states, those of us who purport to think we're benefiting from the US nuclear umbrella, do need to exercise our voice here um, for you know serious nuclear risk reduction strategies. Elimination is going to be very hard to achieve for the indefinitely foreseeable future. But we can, through cooperative, collaborative, collective behavior of the kind that I, I describe as good international citizenship, I think develop a momentum towards uh, at least you know, reducing the risk, which uh, is very, very real. I, I think people ought to take, particularly in the United States, ought to take seriously the, um, you know, the Kissinger, Nunn, uh, Schultz and um, Perry articles in the uh, Wall Street Journal, the famous Four Horsemen articles, uh, going back now more than a decade, in which these hard-headed Cold War realists, all of whom were supporters of nuclear deterrence right through the Cold War, have come out to say in unequivocal terms that, um, you know, whatever conceivable advantage there may have been in the past, that is now far outweighed by the risks associated with the continued possession of nuclear weapons by anyone. When you get people of, of that kind of caliber and that kind of track record, uh, ringing alarm bells in the way that those guys have done in recent years. I think that ought to make policymakers sit up and take notice in a way that, um, and frankly, unfortunately, they've, they've not been doing. Gareth, I'm going to go to a couple of questions we've had emailed in. One is from uh, William in Carbondale, Illinois. He said, both Australia and the United States face challenges concerning immigration policy. What can we learn from each other's experiences in terms of international citizenship what would you recommend as a humane and practical 
immigration policy? Well, it's got to be a policy which recognizes the absolute necessity to accept significant numbers, those of us who have the economic capacity to do so, the wealth to do so, significant numbers of the world's displaced uh, people, refugees, asylum seekers. The Australian track record on this in recent years has not been a pretty one. We, our reaction to the so-called you know, boat people, uh, born partially of a moral sense of wanting to avoid people drowning at sea, which is totally defensible, and partly of resistance to the, the ugliness of people traffickers and smugglers, which is an American problem too, of course, with the South and in Europe. It's partly born of that, but it's also partly born of a, a lack of generosity of spirit, which I think we really have to have to reconsider. We, we can do better than that. Uh, we can set much larger quotas uh, for accepting uh, refugees from those people who are stuck in so many parts of the world at the moment looking for resettlement but unable to find it. I mean, hundreds of thousands, millions of people are in that uh, in that category, and um, I think we just we just we just have to be more generous. It's, it's it's a real mark of good international citizenship. It's one of the tests of good international citizenship. I think how you respond, in particular, to you know the issue of people who've been displaced and have suffered as a result of war, civil conflict, or atrocity crimes. I think there's a very direct connection there with the the other themes that I've, I've talked about, and uh, all of us have a responsibility to act accordingly. Charles from um, Hoffman Estates, which is a suburb of Chicago, asked, um, said America has been criticized for not embarking more on economic development and aid programs in Southeast Asia and the Pacific. What is your perspective on that? I know you spent a lot of your time as foreign minister focusing on the uh, Asian Pacific region. Well, I think America has been reasonably generous in terms of its of its aid programs, um, perhaps focusing less on my part of the world than some others. Um, but, you know, we ought not to underappreciate that. Uh, it's incredibly important part of exercising influence in a way that generates respect from countries to to be a generous aid donor and to give your aid in a way that doesn't just focus on what you get back from it but in terms of what you can do in terms of poverty alleviation or improving the quality of governance uh, in these countries and so on and um, I, I look I, I think it's very important that we we try not to politicize um, you know, the application of aid. I mean, it's, that's an endemic problem around the world. People put aid where they think they'll, countries put it where they think they'll generate the, you know, the most immediate returns for other national interests. But, um, you know, decency demands that um, we were a bit more generous than that. And the countries that are the most generous aid donors, the Scandinavians stand out in this respect. Uh, do generate real reputational returns um, from that, which benefits them in other ways. And, um, you know, my one of my favorite examples, it's an ironic example, but it's deliberately ironic, is that squeaky clean Sweden, which is one of the world's most prominent aid donors, uh, and prominent as a good international citizen against all my other benchmarks as well, human rights advancement and so on, also happens to be one of the world's biggest suppliers of conventional weapons, because it's the kind of country uh, that everyone feels totally comfortable and relaxed in dealing with. There's no, there's no belief that Sweden's motives in doing this stuff could possibly be ugly. And that's, um, so, you know, the, I keep on coming back to the hard-headed, the realist justification, apart from the obvious moral justification for uh, for being a decent country. And I think, um, you know, America's able to, to learn that lesson and I hope it continues to uh, to demonstrate it in the future. Well, you gave a talk about a month ago in Tasmania about the the, the, the world after COVID. And you, be, you began it by saying the world is the more fragile, volatile, and danger, dangerous place than has been the case for a very long time. You talked about COVID. You talked about the Russian invasion of Ukraine, you know, Chinese adventurism, um, and also the United States. And you'll know, take on all of those. But I also would wonder, I mean, you've been a, uh, you spent a lot of time in the United States. You know a lot of Americans. You've been a real strong friend of the United States, but also a critical one, which is in some ways the best friends you can have. What um, what is your sense of the world that we're in right now? You know, as it perter pertains to COVID, you know, the norms that were shattered by the Russian invasion, the rise of China, and the uh, the kind of erratic political environment in the United States. Well, it's 
not the kind of environment that encourages me to call the, the memoir incorrigible optimist <laughs> any longer. It's um, a lot of reasons for, for caution, for pessimism. But I think, you know, wheels do turn. Um, prisons do get re-elected or dismissed. Um, prime ministers change, governments change, attitudes change. Uh, but there's a lot of a lot of worrying things out there, and one of the biggest worries I think for all of us and the rest of the world is the current quality of American democracy. I, I have to say this: it it's painful to say it, but um, but uh, America's reputation, America's credibility, America's effectiveness dramatically declined uh, during the the Trump years, and um, there's not a gigantic amount of confidence that uh, that things have fundamentally changed. And you know the the horrifying prospect of another Trump administration or even a a Trump light, a DeSantis administration, someone smarter but just as uh, you know, problematic in terms of their values, is is really really troubling. And the, the deadlocks and gridlocks in the American system, the American tradition of exceptionalism, um, is troubling. I mean, I've, I've often quoted, and I do in my my book. You might have noticed a, a line from Bill Clinton after he left the presidency back in um, in two thousand and two. Um, and he said something in a, in a private gathering I was on a platform with him uh, that I've never heard him say publicly since. And I never hear from any American politician. It's just too neuralgic. He said, look, America's got two choices about the way in which we use this great and then unrivaled economic and military power that we have. One is to use it to try to stay top dog on the global block in perpetuity. The other is to create a world in which, try to create a world in which we're comfortable living when we're no longer top dog on the global block. And I thought that was just pitch perfect. It anticipated what we now see the rise of China as a very assertive competitor in the global environment who has to be you know, realistically accommodated. And the best way of accommodating it is not to insist on perpetual US primacy, perpetual US predominance, perpetual US, uh, you know, single, almost the solipsist approach that we've seen. Uh, the way to address these issues is through adopting a cooperative, collective, collaborative mindset. It doesn't mean being a patsy. It doesn't mean uh, accepting uh, Chinese overreach, which has been spectacular in terms of a lot of domestic human rights issues, obviously, and also in terms of some of its assertiveness externally, South China Sea and elsewhere, Taiwan issue again. Uh, but it does mean it does mean recognizing that the world changes and countries have to change with it. And uh, the only way we can any of us guarantee a, a safer and saner future um, is through a, a cooperative mindset rather than a, you know, one that's that's relentlessly confrontational. It's the only way forward. I want to go through just a couple of maxims on kind of leadership and governance that I, I pulled from your book. And one of them is, um, you, I think you're speaking specifically of Australia, but I think it's much more broadly applicable. You say, there has never been a golden age of bipartisanship. The biggest policy challenges have always been fiercely contested. Well, that's that's true. But I mean, nonetheless, you can still, within that framework, um, it's not it's not a happy clappy environment. It's always going to be people marking out their space and identifying difference and trying to take political advantage of that difference. But when push comes to shove on the really big existential issues and the really big national interest issues, um, it is critical that there be a sense of acceptance by the outs of what the ins are trying to do and the ins make some accommodation to the legitimate demands of the outs. And that's that's the way things get done. That's the way you know civilization advances. That's the way things have traditionally been done in the United States. I mean, I, I knew well the Lee Hamiltons, the Richard Lugars, the, those people who were the you know the, the the swing voices, the the middle voices, the the sane voices in the American Congress, and they're just not there anymore. And increasingly, we're seeing this sort of polarization take place in in many other capitals. So. I think you can you can have legitimate democratic contest of ideas and contest of operational delivery strategies, but at the end of the day, there's no substitute for a sense of, um, of you know common interest on the big things that really matter. And unless we can recreate that domestically in our respective countries, unless we can recreate that internationally, uh, then we are headed for some very very dangerous times indeed.
You also talk a lot about the need to blend pragmatism and idealism. And you give a, a couple examples in Australian politics um, dealing with the Green Party. And I guess in one case, Prime Minister Rudd was pushing through a, a fairly ambitious climate change package, needed their support, and they were not there saying it wasn't effectively perfect enough. Mm. And that obviously made you uh, very, very mm. frustrated. Talk about that. I mean, just sort of idealism versus pragmatism. <clears throat> well, making the best the enemy of the good is a very recurrent phenomenon in politics, domestically and internationally. And it's, it's very, very dangerous because at the end of the day, you just do very often have to have to compromise on your ideals in order to move the game forward. I mean, let me put this in an international context about disarmament. Um, there's a big argument constantly goes on uh, within the disarmament community of NGOs and civil, civil society about the principle of no first use of nuclear weapons. People like me say, look, the ultimate game is, of course, no use at all of nuclear weapons, elimination of nuclear weapons. But crucially, we've got to do some serious nuclear risk reduction and getting that doctrinal shift a commitment by the nuclear armed states to no first use um, is, a, is a critical step forward. The, you know, the purists say, no, 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 we're, we're not going to embrace that. Uh, I'm talking about the purists on the left. The purists on the right have got a, a different view again, which is totally... Um, Un, unsympathetic, but purists on the left tend to say, no, 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 it's, it's not a matter of no first use, it's a matter of no use, so we're not going to compromise on that. And that's that's dangerous because, um, you know, in the kind of dynamics that are now working themselves out with the Nuclear Non-Preparation Treaty Review Conference currently taking place in New York, it, it's critical that people have a mindset which doesn't make the best the enemy of the good, but just does what we possibly can to improve the situation pragmatically, to inch our way forward. And uh, that's that's a, a message for domestic politics, I think, as well. Well, another your maxim, this was uh, referred to specifically in the context of human rights, but I think it has some really broad and interesting applications. <clears throat> you say, um, do that which is productive, minimize, but don't entirely avoid doing what is unproductive and avoid at all costs doing that which is counterproductive. Talk about that. Well, it, it, that is the mantra I adopted in terms of international human rights issues. I used to drive my diplomats mad when I was foreign minister by giving them long lists of amnesty, the political prisoners and people likely to be executed in other countries and asking them to go in and make representations to those governments to try to try to stop it happening. I knew very well that that was going to be unproductive in the overwhelming number of cases. But nonetheless, it seemed to me to be worth doing because of the, the water on a stone effect, of just the sense of creating in those countries a sense that someone was watching and that their reputations were not being enhanced by this kind of behavior. What you do have to avoid is, is doing stuff which is counterproductive for the very people that you're trying to help. And sometimes, um, you know, megaphone diplomacy on human rights issues, although it's very popular with domestic constituencies and very understandable, uh, is incredibly counterproductive. One very good example uh, from my own period as, as foreign minister uh, was the situation in East Timor, which, um, as you know, as everyone remembers, was a pretty horrifying situation after the Indonesian invasion of the place in 1975 and um, a very neuralgic issue in international affairs in domestic Australian affairs as well. And I was working very closely with my Indonesian uh, foreign minister counterpart, Ali Alitas, to try and, and get Indonesia to change its position. We didn't then think that independence, anyone thought, no one thought that independence was a realistic prospect, but um, certainly autonomy, getting the military out, getting aid in, getting respect for culture, language, and so on, and um, just dramatically improving the human rights environment uh, would be a big step forward. And Alitas told me in 1994 that he was on the verge of persuading President Suharto to embrace just that approach, to get rid of the pebble in the shoe of Indonesia's relations with us and with many other countries. Unfortunately, Bill Clinton, um, on his way to a big APEC meeting, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation meeting uh, to be held in Indonesia that year, very exercised himself by the East Timor problem, uh, made a, a public statement 
saying one of the things he's going to be raising with President Suharto is the absolute necessity to recognize the need for autonomy uh, by East Timor and getting the military out and doing all the things that we want to do. That had the immediate effect, unfortunately, of President Suharto saying, well, whatever else I might have been prepared to do, I'm not going to be perceived to um, you know, respond to pressure uh, imposed by the United States. So it just didn't happen. A classic example of well-intentioned diplomacy, lobbying, public statements, having totally the, uh, you know, the opposite effect that you want. We've had some similar experiences, I think, in recent years, overtly protesting against the possibility of execution of Australian nationals in you know, different Southeast Asian countries and generating a response from those countries that will, you know, we're not going to be perceived as bowing to pressure. So, you know, quiet diplomacy sometimes do, does have its place, but um, don't shy from doing that, which is unproductive. Of course, you do that, which is productive, which generates results. That's the, that's the, that's the, the ideal, but, um, but you know, human rights is, it's, it's a long slog and it's worthwhile. Um, playing that, that that role, even though the good international citizenship role in relation to human rights issues, even though it's not going to immediately bear fruit. Well, as we da wind down, I, I want to just present kind of two images of politics that you, you have presented. Um, and there are interesting contrasts. You write in your book, you said politics is a bloody and dangerous trade. And however talented or lucky one might be, setbacks, hurts, and humiliations are inevitable. Even those whose game, whose careers are on balance successful, hardly ever leave on on top of their game, and at absolutely a time of their own choosing. Um, but then I <coughs> I saw you give a talk uh, via uh, via YouTube to a group at Oxford, and which you you made that same point, but that they also told the students, but. If you want to change the world, be active in politics. That is the one avenue that will allow you to influence, you know, the macro world. Well, I strongly believe that world. You, you don't change the world by observing it, by analyzing it, by talking about it. You can only ultimately change the world by getting in there and doing something to, to move the game forward. And um, realistically, by far the best way of being able to get things done is by uh, turning the wheels of, of government. Uh, better still, if it's a, a major power that's capable of influencing things on its own on its own momentum. Harder if you're a middle power, or harder still if you're a small power that nobody takes much notice of. But politics, it, it's a it's a it's a decent profession at the end of the day, and if you take it seriously and take seriously the responsibilities that go with representative office, and it's a profession that can, in fact, bear fruit on on a macro scale. I mean, you know. I don't for the slightest uh, denigrate those who make their spend their lives doing micro things. I mean, assisting people individually, case by case, one on one. That's just incredibly important, and uh, social decency depends on on that happening on a on a massive scale. But at the end of the day, if you really want to to move the needle, uh, you've got to be in there in government. And uh, you know, one of the but one of my one of my colleagues who shall remain nameless. I remember him saying to me once as we were reminiscing about our time in politics, you know, mate, he said, I don't really mind all that much, whether we're in government or opposition. I just love politics. I just love the business of politics. And I I, I thought, you were a very sick puppy. You're a very sick puppy. That's that's not what politics ought to be about. That's what politics must not be about, just being there for the sake of the game, uh, the, the thrill of the chase. Politics has to be about getting there to get into government and when you're in government doing decent things, doing the right thing for the country, the right thing for the region, the right thing for the world. And, um, you know, there's gonna be frustrations, there's gonna be setbacks. It's right to say that very few people have undisputedly uh, you know, brilliant careers going from low to high with no bumps along the way. That's, that's not anyone's experience. But at the end of the day, if you feel that you've come away from it having made just at least a little bit of difference, then I think the game is worth the candle and it's critical uh, that people, um, people go into it. And it's critical, critical to keep your sense of optimism. Um, I said before that uh, maybe I, I wouldn't be brave enough to call a memoir now, incorrigible optimist, but I do think it's incredibly important that people in public life that have the capacity to, to move these needles maintain a sense of that, that, that 
change is possible. Change for the better is possible. Both optimism and pessimism are, are very, um, very self-reinforcing. And, uh, you know, optimism is not self-fulfilling, but it's, I think it's a necessary precondition. You don't get out of bed in the morning. You don't try to change uh, the world unless you believe that at the end of the day, some change is, is possible. So that's my storyline for, uh, you know, for the next generation. Don't abandon politics for the joys of the finance sector and the big bucks. I mean, do do recognize that you'll get an enormous amount of satisfaction uh, from a career that does involve you know moving the game forward making your country and the world a safer and saner and more decent and just place well i'm going to end here with the, the to me the most enduring uh, image from your book was um i think it's 1990 the steps of the sydney opera, opera house and you're standing next to nelson nelson mandela a sun splash day. I mean, yes. someone who's emerged from 27 years in prison without any traces of bitterness. I mean, talk about an uplifting moment. Well, of all the people I've met in my public life, I have to say that Mandela unequivocally remains the most uh, entrancing, endearing, enchanting. I mean, just just a brilliant human being in every possible way. Uh, that, that sense, that capacity for forgiveness, the, the capacity to move on after all the horrors that he'd experienced, the capacity to find common ground with F.W. de Klerk, his you know, lifelong African or opponent, well, it was just absolutely magical. They, they don't breed too many like Mandela, unfortunately, but um, when they do, and when you get an opportunity to share the kind of moment that I did on the steps of the Opera House with him, and that's, um, that's, uh, that's on the cover of... Uh, Let's cover my book. I'm just, oh, it's, it's, it is it's, indeed. It. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Um, you know, sitting beside him there. And um, I, I can also remember sitting beside him at Newland Stadium, uh, watching the uh, Australia South Africa rugby test uh, again, you know, after he was released, obviously, from prison, was new president. And, and that, that stadium full of thick necked Afrikaners, you know, very few black faces among them chanting in in unison mandela 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 um, it was just just a magical moment to see that, that the capacity for bringing people together that someone of that that human quality that statesmanlike quality that 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 decency um the, the, the change that you 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 can be responsible for and that that, that was magic magic moments and uh, i think you know one of my the best things we ever did in australian foreign policy was lead the charge um, lead, one of the leaders of the charge in the anti-apartheid movement, in particular through basically inventing the concept of financial sanctions, which uh, at the end of the day, far more than trade sanctions or sports boycotts or other naming and shaming, did bring down the apartheid regime. So, uh, but um, if you're looking for role models, anyone in the world, I mean, Mandela is just up there in lights. He's unassailable. Great. Well, Gareth, thank you so much for really a delightful conversation. I'm going to continue to... Uh, to read your works. I mean, I would, I would urge our, our listeners to uh, to go to Gareth's website. He has this most wonderfully organized and um, really accessible uh, compendium of speeches, essays, books, etc. So it's a real resource for students who are interested in international affairs. I look forward to reading more things. I, I'm sure they will be coming. And I'll just say finally, Gareth, my wife and I love Australia. We love Melbourne. So uh, the next time we make it there, we'd, we'd love to look you up and uh, say hello to you. That's uh, absolutely, absolutely an offer on the table and a good bottle of Shiraz to go with it. And uh, I think we could have a very pleasant time together. So thanks, John. I really, really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Great, great interview, great questions and uh, great opportunity to, uh, to talk to the, the Simon Institute. Great institution. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for watching another edition of our series. We will have this video on our website in the coming days. Look at it, pass it on to family and friends. <coughs> Pardon me. And thank you for continuing to support the Institute and keeping the, the memory of Paul Simon alive and well. Thanks so much.